Good morning. So I've asked a few people what they think this crude symbolic thing is symbolic of. So if you haven't answered me yet, what do you think? Anybody got any ideas? You be quiet. <laughs> that is true. Good observation. That's not what. So what is this? Anybody know? What's that? Okay. We're close. Yes and no. Yeah, the holy and the holy of holies. Okay? So it is the tabernacle is around you. So can we have a picture of that part, please? I think Zeke is somewhere or somebody somewhere. Are they supposed to know? I want the first picture of the tabernacle, please. So this is very crude, what we're going to see here, and we're going to hopefully have a picture that's a little more true on the, on the screen. But we're not having one yet. Okay. So that's just a picture of the outer thing. So this is going to represent what's in the center. See the box? So this is the most holy and holy, the, that place, the inner courtyard or whatever, the inner court, the inner courtyard, the tent actually is what it was called, was 30 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. But if it went 15 feet high, you wouldn't be able to see what was in it, so we couldn't do that. So we used tables because that's what we had on hand. So, but what, what I'd like you to see is, do you know who you are? So picture that this empty space around it, which is not big enough, is the uh, outer courtyard, which is everything around inside. And, and picture the edge of these chairs is, is another wall. Then you're outside the wall. What, who are you? You're not Gentiles. You're the Israelites. No. I mean, kind of, but not specific enough. You're not the Israelites. The Israelites, see where... So you guys are right around the temple. Look, do you see where the Israelites are? Way outside. That one is a little less understanding. I, I wish I had a different picture better. But anyways, okay. Huh? The... Yeah, but a specific tribe. So that picture doesn't illustrate it as well as I would like it to. But um, so you guys would actually be the Levites. Because the Levites actually camped around, and it doesn't show it in that picture, so I don't know why. Okay. All right. Anyways, the, the, so the, the priests and all the Levites and every, all the people who worked in the temple and serviced the temple, they lived around it. And actually, this chair represents somebody's specific dwelling. And that would be the dwelling of Moses. So Moses had a tent right outside the opening to the whole um, courtyard. All right. So I just wanted to give you that uh, brief thing. We're going to read the passage. Now, I did say to somebody, I said, well, you'd know exactly what it was if you were reading ahead. So, anyway, it's not, not that I've told you to read ahead, but you would have known exactly. Chapter 9 is where we're at. We've been in the book of Hebrews. If you're here for the first time, or second, or third, or 17th, you, you know we've been in the book of Hebrews for a little while. Um, we're in chapter 9 now. So we're going to read just through the first 10 verses, and, uh, and then I'm going to, yeah, have a couple volunteers. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary, for there was an, a tabernacle prepared, or a tent, it actually could say. The outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, this is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, or a tent, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and ark of covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood which he offers for himself, and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this. 
that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect or complete in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Lord, as we uh, look through this aspect of the holy place, Lord, I pray you help us to understand it a little better and how it relates to you, the symbolic illustration of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So I did this in a little bit because I think a lot of times we as Christians are lazy. I say we. And so a lot of times we read the New Testament and it says a lot of things. It infers back to the Old Testament, but we don't really have a clue what those things are. So we don't have the full meaning of what the New Testament's saying. Does that make sense? Because the Old Testament truly does influence what's written in the new and if you've been in any study that continually um, brings the bible together like in genesis even right we see how the whole bible connects in fact we're told to teach the whole counsel of god not just bits and pieces and what's easy so that's one of the reasons we're we're um, going through this and and i wanted something visual even though it doesn't look anything like what it was it just hasn't i want you to have something in your head and hopefully you'll have something better than even what I have here. So, I need four volunteers who are strong and have endurance. <laughs> oh, you think you do? All right, Scott, come on. Come on. Did you want to come too, Monica? Did you, or did you put your hand back down? I'm trying. <laughs> okay, no, it's not that bad. You can come. Oh, you want Kurt to come? Okay, come on, Kurt. I'll make four. All right, so you two come here. Okay, you guys hold this up. All right, whichever way is. Yeah, so hold it right there. Let me get by you. Okay, you guys have this one. You can figure it out. Over the long way. So you go right, right in front of here. All right, so like I said, this is not like um, perfectly, would you say, uh, symmetrical because the Holy of Holies would have been like roughly half the size of the other. So if I had two more tables up here, it, it would represent it a little bit better, okay? Because the holy place was a lot bigger. The holy place, which was where this stuff is here, but, but these represent the... Um, the, the um, veils, which you would have to go through to get into each, each um, section. So this one would get you into the holy place, and that one would get you into the most holy place. So you guys have it easy. You're done. You guys stay there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the different parts of the holy place because they matter. And I don't know how I'm going to do this, so... We're going to have different pictures on the wall because each one of these is going to point to Christ somehow, and a lot of them very specifically. And one thing I want you to think of that, that um, this ha could have happened, you know, this happened in maybe around 1300 BC where, the, where the, um, the book of the law was written and where it happened. So that was a long time ago, was it not? But it was also a long time, maybe hold it down a little bit. For the people back here. Yeah, that's good, right there. So maybe, though, you guys are going to have to have the most endurance, just saying. So. <laughs> so we can be like the Old Testament when the guy got tired. Remember, Moses got tired. Somebody came, and so Dwayne will hold your arm for you. <laughs> so, but I want you to get like a little glimpse of it because it affects so much of Scripture. And you read about it in the New Testament over and over again, and specifically in this one. So we're going to look at first the lampstand, and th this is symbolic. Do we have a picture of the lampstand? I don't know who's running the thing. Yeah, so it's, this is only three. There's supposed to be seven. Seven has a number of completeness. Seven has a number um, that God uses over and over again when it relates to himself, of uh, perfect and complete. So picture this seven, but it's, it's kind of similar-ish. 
And so, okay, so when you think of the lampstand, it does what? What is the lampstand for? It does hold candles, thank you very much. But what is the purpose of holding candles? Light. And, and actually, I don't, it didn't even hold candles. Um, it had olive oil that would continuously feed it. And so it would always be burning, okay? But this is just a, a kind of a picture. But yes, it was to light, because um, when you think of this room, there was no windows. It would, would have been 100% dark. In fact, when it, it was, why it was called a tent is because it was a tent. Because there was tent material over it and then a curtain in front. So it was, it was built like a tent because they would tear it down and take it to the next place and tear it down and go on further. So, so anyways, let's think of the lampstand. We're going to look at Exodus 25. We're going to look at some scripture this morning. And we'll try to do it quickly. <laughs> Exodus 25, 31 through 40. Exodus 25. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are, able, are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. Six branches shall go out from its sides. Three branches of the lampstand from its one side. And three branches of the lampstand from its other side. Three cups shall be shaped like almond blossoms in, one, in the one branch. A bulb and a flower and three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch and a bulb and a flower. So the other six branches, so first six branches going out from the lampstand. And in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs and its flowers. A bulb shall be under the first pair of branches coming out of it and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their bulbs and their branches shall be of one piece with it. All of it shall be one piece of hammered work of pure gold. Then you shall make its lamps seven in number, and they shall mount its lamps as, so as to shed light on the space in front of it. Its snuffers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of, from a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. See that you make them after the pattern for them, which was shown to you on the mountain. I'll let you guys put that away, because it'll be a while. Just set it, set it over here. Thank you, guys. Give them a round of applause. All the people who helped me. I just try to make it look like you're going to be there a really long time. So, so, <laughs> so what, what we see here is that, you know, Eliza was nice enough to let us use this and have something to look at, but I guess she didn't have enough money to have the one that's in here. <laughs> Did you notice all the gold and how fancy and intricate it was? If she, if she did have the money, she might live somewhere else. Who knows? You know, she wouldn't even be here at all. But anyway, so the point is it was very ex extravagant, very detailed. The way everything was made in the temple or the tabernacle was very specific and, had, and it all had a purpose to represent Christ. So 27, going on of this idea, Exodus 27, 20 and 21, says, You shall charge the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually in the tent of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony. Aaron and his son shall keep it in order from evening till morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. So this light was to, was to light up the holy place. And it was to be always burning, never to go out. So whenever the, the, most, the holy place was set up, it was always to be burning. It represented, it had some representation. Number one, it represented the nation. Isaiah 42. Like I said, we're going to look at some scripture this morning. Isaiah 42, 5 through 7. Thus says the Lord God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will point you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from prison. To the children of Israel, and we've said this probably before, but the children of Israel were supposed to be a light to the world to bring them to God. 
They were supposed to see something in them that was different than the darkness of the world around them. That, this was illustrative of that. Also, in Isaiah 4, 49, 6, it looks forward. It predicts another light. And it says, that he, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I, God the Father, said, I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That was predicting a light that was to come. In John chapter 8, verse 12, that was fulfilled, which would have been about how many years later? Did you catch it? Around 1300-ish, yeah. Around 1300 years later, someone fulfilled that. Who was that? John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them and saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the one who was predicted of back in Isaiah, and he's the one who fulfilled it in the first century when he came born as a baby. But also, it's pointing to the future, the light in Revelation, towards the back of your book, in fact, the last page probably, um, Revelation uh, 20, uh, 21, 23. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. See, Jesus is the exact illustration. Everything pictured in it is symbolic of Christ. The light is symbolic it, of Christ who was to come someday, who is the light of the world. He brings darkness and turns it into light right he comes into the darkness and makes it light like he comes into the darkness of our sin and he forgives it and creates something light and and uh, brilliant with it in each one of us who accept him as savior but he's also the light that's going to illumine the heaven someday when we get there there will be no need of the sun no need of a lamp because god will be there and his light will shine so there'll be no need of anything else. Kind of cool, huh? Illustrative of him. What about us? Philippians 2. In each one of these almost could be a message of itself, but we're trying not to do that. All right, 2, 13 and 14. I mean, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Are we in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Okay, this is what we're supposed to be, though. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. Who is that talking about? Who are supposed to appear as lights in the world? Us. Matthew 5, 16. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your God in heaven. So we are supposed to be that light. Because we are children of the light, Jesus, God, we are supposed to resemble that light and, and bring others to Christ because of the light that we're shining. Not that comes from ourselves, but comes from who? God himself, right? That, that he has given us at the moment of salvation. And then it also says in Psalm 119, 105, thy word is what? Right, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And, and by the way, the word, that's a whole other study, but who is, the, who is the living word? Jesus himself. And this is the written word for you and I. All right, so that's the, the light. I don't know if I should put them out or if they're safe to be like that. But let's, I think, yeah, we'll go over here. And this one actually is the closest representation we have here, <laughs> just so you know, because it's bread. And there's supposed to be bread. And there's supposed to be 12. Why would there be 12 loaves of bread? To represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. So bread. In fact, it's not only called the table of show bread. Does anybody else know what it's called? The table of what? Anybody know? Presence. 
not presence and gifts, but presence is, I'm right here, <laughs> okay? So it's called the table of presence, or it's actually even the bread is called the bread of presence. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, when we look at what the bread represents, that will make a little more um, a difference on what, it, on what it is. So, okay, let's look at Exodus 25, back to where it was uh, first. Because in Exodus 25, and that is, it's, he's telling them how to do all these things, how to lay out the tabernacle. That's why we keep going back to it. Exodus 25, 23 through 30. It says, You shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long and one cubit wide, and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold, just like the one we have right here, and make a gold border around it. You shall make for it a rim of handbreadth around it, and you shall make a gold border for the rim around it. You shall make four gold rings for it and put rings on the four corners which are on its four feet. The rings shall be close to the rim as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold so that with them the table may be carried. You shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the bread of the, you see it? presence on the table before me at all times. Look at Leviticus 24. And it talks about the bread itself. Leviticus. It's a book that I'm sure you go to often for just joy, joy reading. Oh, what did I say? 24. Leviticus 24. Five through nine. Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. The only thing we don't have is a pure gold table. You shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the Lord's offering by fire and his portion forever. Who did I tell you was allowed to go into the holy place? The priests and the Levites, right? Because not all Levites are priests. So, so all of that tribe. Who was to eat this bread? Did you catch it? No, the priests. No, the priests, right? The priests were. It depends if you're just a Levite or a priest. <laughs> but um, the priests were to eat it. And did you catch how often? Once a week. So at every Passover, or every Sabbath, I mean, they would put another piece of bread there. I think I got that right. Did I say that right? Um, and so the, the priests would eat the old one and then put a new, new 12 there. So they were able to eat that. In fact, do you, anybody know of one person who ate the, the bread? King David did, right? And Jesus brought it up and said that he even ate the bread and didn't even condemn him for it. So that's, that's an old, another interesting topic. All right, so, but we say this is illustrative of something. So look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Starting with verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves. Okay, just so you know, what just happened was Jesus feeding the 5,000. Remember, he take a couple, couple of loaves of bread and a few fish, and then he fed thousands of people with it. It was a miracle. Okay, now we come to this passage. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for, to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore, they said to him, What shall we do that we may do the work of the works of God? And Jesus answered and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Did you, believe that? Did you realize the only work you can ever do to be saved is the work of belief? Any other work that you do, any other good deed, any other righteous thing, going to church, reading your Bible, 
talking, helping little ladies across the road. Any of those things will not get you into heaven. It's only the work of belief and trust in who Christ is. All right, so, um, yeah, starting with verse 30. So they said to him, well, then what do you give us for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. So who does he say he was? The bread of life. This was representative of him, Jesus, the bread of life, who gives food to those. In fact, he even used that picture in the wilderness, right? Of when they, of when they got the, the manna. And it was given to them by God, which we'll see is actually in the, in the um, Ark of the Covenant. But so he says he is the word. And in fact, in Matthew 4.4, 4, even Jesus said, um, you, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How do we truly grow? By being in his word. You know, a good a statement I've heard before, if you get up in the morning, no Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no breakfast. We should eat from God's word before we eat to fill our, so I should say it this way. To, we should eat to fill our soul before we eat to fill our bellies. Does that make sense? So God, that should always come first and foremost. So it, it was representative of Jesus coming someday. So, oh, whoops, I pushed the wrong one anyways, didn't I, Eliza? I know, that's what messed me up. I'm not blaming you. <laughs> okay, so it didn't look this, and it surely wasn't plastic. Just saying, okay? But this is called the uh, golden altar. It's not very golden, but whatever. We've got a picture. No, that's a showbread. Now let's go to the next picture, the golden altar. There you go. That's a lot more gold. Yes. Anyways, so the golden, uh, golden altar is in Exodus 30. I told him I didn't want to turn that on too early because I didn't know if I could breathe. <laughs> I can already smell it. So, but it is representative of what we've already seen because remember it said something about frankincense on the, on the showbread? This is frankincense, right? Yeah. yeah. So Exodus chapter 30, 34 through 38. Then the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself spices, stacked, and Annika and Galbanum, spices with pure frankincense. See? Hmm. There shall be an equal part of each. We just have only frankincense today, but oh well. With it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you, and it will be most holy to you. The incense which you shall make you shall not make in the same proportions for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any of it, any like it, to use as a perfume, shall be cut off from his people. This was only supposed to be a special mixture that was going to happen. Because what is after this? Do you remember? I know I had let them leave. But what was after this? The, the tent, right? The curtain to the Holy of Holies. So this is something that they did before or just as they were going into. In fact, it has the idea of this is how to go into the presence of the Holy of Holies to, for purification, for getting ready. In fact, it's in Leviticus 16, we won't go there, it talks about how they took the coals because, it, yeah, okay, <laughs> different picture, but same idea. So the, there were coals in there that were heating it and they would use those coals as when they went into the Holy of Holies um, to offer incense in there. So what is, so the incense, which, which we'll talk a little more about. So the incense that, we ha that they take into the Holy of Holies would then cover the mercy seat. Now, maybe we should go into the Holy of Holies just for a second. 
Okay, this isn't, isn't a very good representation of a golden mercy seat because the seat would be very little and the whole thing would be this big. But thank you, Shelly, for making this many years ago because I was able to use it here. <laughs> but but the, I just want to give you a picture. So we can go to the next one too, please, the Ark of the Covenant. So I had something like that. So the mercy seat was in between the cherubim, the wings. So they would come in here with the incense and the incense would go over the mercy seat. Okay, the smoke of the incense will go over the mercy seat. Well, let's look at a few verses to see why would that matter? Why would that matter? So, um, uh, okay, David is the one who starts at Psalm 141, verse 2. And then we'll go to Revelation. Whoops, I went by it. Psalm 141, verse 2. David said, may my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. So the incense would be offered twice a day, in the morning and the evening, not going into the Holy Holies, but the priests would do this twice a day, in the morning and evening, do incense. Once a year, he would go into the most holy place. Who was the only one allowed into the Holy of Holies? the high priest, and only once a year. And that time was to take the sins that people didn't realize they did or didn't do on purpose. And also, when he would come here, he would offer up first, he would offer a bowl, not only for the sins of the people, because that blood would be going to the Holy of Holies, but he'd have to first do it for himself because he was a sinner so that he wouldn't go in with any unconfessed sin in a way. Because then what would happen to him? He'd die. In fact, they said that sometimes they would, they would tie a rope on the foot of the high priest going in because nobody else could go in without dying so that if he died and he didn't really get right before God before he went in, because God would take that very seriously. If he didn't get right before God before he went in, he would, God would take him because that was the holiness of God, right? They would be able to pull him out. <laughs> some say that happened, some say no, but... It might have, right? Makes sense. All right, so David thought of this incense as the idea of prayers. That when he prayed, it was like offering incense to the Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 5. That's our first one. Revelation 5, 8. For those of you who went through Revelation a while ago, you might even remember this. Revelation 5, 8. And it says... When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. And what's the next thing say? Which are the prayers of the saints. That's very clear, isn't it? So the incense that was being offered there, and that's, by the way, not the temporary one on earth. That's the eternal one that's in the heavens, right? The eternal holy of holies. The... the, the this, the, the incense that was offered there was the prayers of the saints. So picture that. So every time you pray, it's like offering this incense to God. It goes over, by the way, the mercy seat, which we'll get there in a moment. But um, another couple pages on, uh, Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the what? Prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Does that sound a lot like this picture? It is, isn't it? It's just the one eternal one that's in heaven. So think of that. So your prayer. So, so let's go. We're going into the Holy of Holies. So those, that incense is going over the mercy seat. What does the mercy seat represent? Anybody know? What's that? God's throne? Kind of, yes, but what? Simply, what does it mean? The presence of God, right? It represents God himself and his presence. And it represents, and he's called mercy because he is a God who withholds judgment even when we deserve it, right? 
so it kind of goes along with that verse that says, um, go to him with prayer, you know, and find mercy and help in time of need, right? So those, it's the, uh, the prayers are going over the mercy seat of Christ, of God. So think of it. Whenever you pray, it's like that incense going over his mercy. You're asking for his mercy when you pray, right? Because actually, not only, because you're not wanting your will to be done, even though you may in the flesh, you're wanting what's best to be done. And that's God's mercy to always give you what's best and not just what you think is best. That's the mercy of God. All right, so, so think of your prayers that way as they go over the altar. So the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat does represent Christ. The Day of Atonement was the time that the, the priest would come in and offer. And he would actually, remember I said, he would, because outside this, this thing would be a huge, so outside the holy, in the court, outer courtyard, would be a huge platform where they would offer all the sacrifices. So the priest, the high priest, would have to offer the sacrifice out here because it, because it couldn't happen in the holy place. It had to happen outside of it. And he would offer it, take the blood that was shed for his sin and for the sins of all Israel. He would come through the holy place and take his incense and he'd come in here and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat from those bulls and goats who died for the, his sin and the sins of all the nation. By the way, the mercy seat is where we meet God for salvation. Christ shed blood, paid the penalty for all our sin. And so it's right there. That picture's gone. But it's right there, between the cherubim, where the mercy seat of Christ is that we meet Jesus. Not the blood of bulls and goats anymore, but the blood of a perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, God, 100% God, 100% man, who was able to make that payment for our sin. And when you come to him and bow to ask for his mercy, that's when you're saved. God, I don't deserve it. I've sinned and wronged you. I've rebelled against you. But God, I now give myself over to your mercy. That you love me anyway. You've died on the cross. You shed your sin, your blood for my sin. And you've saved me. You want to save me. That's where salvation meets, is at the mercy seat. Yeah. The word that's used of this is very similar to the word used in 1 John 2, 2, which talks about Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. The satisfaction. That's what happens on the mercy seat. Our, the satisfaction before God the Father for my sin was completed. Where are we about you today? Have you accepted what Christ did on that cross? Have you come to the mercy seat? See, you can't come to the mercy seat with pride, right? Because you picture the mercy seat, and I don't know about you, but I picture this. I picture somebody coming lowly. Lowly. I need your mercy, Lord. I need forgiveness for my sin. The weight I cannot bear any longer. Please take it. Have you ever done that? I think some people come to Christ and they say, yeah, that sounds good. That's a good idea. All right, I'll do it. And they're not saved. Because they really didn't come humbly realizing they needed him so badly. They just came thinking it was a good idea. Is that how you came to him? Or did you come to him realizing he's the only one who can save you from your sin and you needed him desperately? Well, let's go on quickly, going back to Hebrews, like it said in Hebrews, if you remember right, um, uh, verse 5, it says, but of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Well, we tried to give you like a brief glimpse, and it's not as detailed as we could. We could almost have a message on each one of those, but we, I just wanted to get something in your mind where you had an idea, and so let's just continue these, first few, these last few verses, 6 through 
10, because the other, what we just did was kind of based on the first five. And we're just going to look at some points to consider about the tabernacle and worship. Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. What do we see here? It's uh, with the old system, because we're always contrasting, aren't we, in the last few chapters and the next one or two to come. So the, with the, new, the old system, we just have to keep doing it continually. It wasn't a one-time deal because Jesus hadn't come yet. So it's a continual thing. Verse 7. But unto the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not with taken, without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Only the high priest can come into the presence of God. It's got limitations. Now, do you remember in Matthew 27, 51, when Jesus died, what happened? Does anybody know? So we have people standing here. And if I had an old one or whatever, and I ripped that, veil, ripped that veil, that's what happened when Christ died on the cross. When he died, it said the skies got dark, and the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom, representing that we could go boldly before Christ. We, didn't, we could go into his presence ourselves. Now, you know what happened, though? By the way, in the first century, the, the veil tore... Jesus was showing, God was showing them that now you can go right directly to the Father, to the, to the throne and find mercy. But you know what they did? You know what they did with the, with the veil? They repaired it. How foolish we are. They repaired it. So, like, now God's saying you can come directly to me, but, and don't we do that too sometimes? We start these, we think religiously too much, and we, we put all these these uh, boundaries and limitations on salvation and, and people, and then we're not free to just come before God's presence. But I'm telling you what, Jesus made the way. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you haven't done, you can always come before the throne and find grace and mercy in time of need. All right, verse 8, we've got to get going here. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the only way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. He said, while that tabernacle's there, the other one isn't started yet. That's why the veil was torn, to show them that, hey, this is done away with. But while you still have this, you're not going to have Christ too. You can't take them both. It's only one way or the other. Verse 9, or I think it's still verse. What, which is a symbol of the, for the present time according to both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. A couple more here. He kept us um, from being from what was better. While it was still here, it kept us from what was better. It only symbolizes it wasn't the real thing. This what I just did this morning is an object lesson. And that's what the tabernacle was for. It was an object lesson, and those of you teachers are shaking your head, mm -hmm, is, is what was for the children of Israel to give them pictures that represented Christ who was to come. An object lesson. But it wasn't the real thing. Okay? Jesus is the real thing. That was just an object lesson. And it was just another set of rules. They couldn't make you perfect. They couldn't give you the righteousness that only God can give you. It was only Christ. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. So, I have two questions to close up with this morning. Number one, have you met Jesus at the mercy seat? Has there been a time in your life where you said, yes, I need you, Lord. I need forgiveness for my sins. I want it. Please save me. If not, today is a day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. It's not complicated. It's simple, but it's not easy. Because we have to come humbly and saying there's nothing we have to offer and accept everything that Christ offered. The death for our sins, his burial, and then his resurrection and conquering of death.
the hope that we have that we can be with him for eternity. That was my first question. If you're not saved, get saved today. For all of us, in light of this written around 300 BC, 1300 BC, and Jesus fulfilled it all in the first century AD, what difference does it make in your life? Does it make a difference in your life? Because he's not a dead God, and he's not a lying God. Everything that he pointed to, he fulfilled. All of what we just talked about, and we only hinted, we only got, I only whetted your appetite. But everything that this was supposed to represent, Jesus represented it fully, 100% in the in first century. How does that make a difference? Because you serve a, if you're a believer this morning, you serve a true God who always fulfills what he says he's going to do. How does that make a difference in your life? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for even using crude object lessons that aren't very close to the original. But I pray, Lord, that it will help us all to be able to picture your object lessons to us, Lord, a little better. To see how great Jesus is and how awesome he fulfilled everything that was pointed towards him from the Old Testament, written 1,300 years before it even happened. Thank you, Lord, Lord that we serve a God, the God who is 100% true and 100% committed to upholding everything you've promised. Lord, that gives me hope, I know, that no matter what and how I fail here, I will be in heaven for eternity with you. And I pray that gives us a hope that leads to a desire to please you with our lives and a desire to help others to know you as we know you. In Jesus' name.